Genesis 12, 1 to 9. The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to start with the latest New South Wales drink driving campaign. That's not often the place you start a sermon on Abram at. Uh, But one of them is RBT means you need a plan B. RBT means you need a plan B. The possibility of being caught out drink driving by mobile RBT units is so high, we're led to believe, that we must always have a plan B so that we're not caught. I just happen to know they are always on the other side of that roundabout on the way to Moree. But the logic works, doesn't it? RBT means you need a plan B. That's how I used to think about God and his plans for creation. I know as I was growing up, I understood that God had made the world. I understood that the God had made the world to his design and purpose, that his creation, us humans, had mucked it up. But because God is so powerful, because God is so wise, because God knows all things, he had a plan B in his back pocket so he was never caught out. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Plausible, even right. After all, it acknowledges that God is in charge. It acknowledges that he's in control. It acknowledges that he plans for these events. Perhaps he's even got a plan C, maybe even a plan D. But is that actually how the Bible speaks of God? Well, the Bible's very clear that before the beginning of time, God chose to have a people for himself, a people who were his because Jesus died for their sins. Ephesians 1 verse 4, For he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. The Bible is very clear that God, and I know this sounds astonishing, that God chose Jesus before the creation of the world to die on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For you know that you were redeemed, from your empty way of life inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. The Bible's very clear that this has always been God's purpose, to bring everything together under Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. The Bible is very clear that the whole plan of God is for his glory, for his significance, for him to be in the centre of the picture of the world. And there are too many references for me to read. And so as I was growing up, as I read a book like Ephesians 1 and 1 Peter, I had to come to this conclusion. Whatever happens after the arrival of sin in the world is not plan B. It's plan A. 
It's always been plan A because God is never caught unaware. So what's that plan A? Put simply, it's this, the kingdom of God. So that God is known and glorified by the whole universe. And today we're going to look at what that pattern looks like in the promise of God. Let me pray and then I'll give you a reminder. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can sit here with fans and windows open with thankfulness for rain in our hearts and open it and read it. Father, we've already prayed by your spirit that you'll apply it to us, but we come to you again and ask you to apply this word to our hearts and minds to see your great plan A and what it means for this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, kids with the blue folders, I've already done the first uh, point. The slide will come up here. You've got a very simple question. God never has a, Riley, go to the next slide. God never has a plan B. Okay, so we've already got there. We're at point two. Riley, can you bring up the next one? Let me remind you of what we're doing in this sermon series. Uh, We're working through a book by Vaughan Roberts, God's Big Picture, in order to understand the overarching theme of the Bible. And the overarching theme of the Bible is, what's that, Mr. Stiller? God's kingdom. So go to the next slide, Riley. God's kingdom, that's point two. And we've seen how that was the pattern in the Garden of Eden. We've seen how that's been perished last week. God's kingdom is very simple. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. What did we see last week with Adam and Eve? They're removed from the presence of God. They've chosen to be God instead of God. They don't want to live under his word and under his rule. And so God has moved them out of his place. So how is God going to show his commitment to his creation? I'm at point three on the outline. Last week, as you trace through what happened in Genesis 3 through to through Genesis 11, uh, there was a pattern that emerged, wasn't there? Uh, There was a pattern that emerged which always culminated in God's undeserved mercy. God doesn't neglect his creation. There's a pattern there of human sinning, God rightly judging them, and then hand in hand with God's right judgment is God's mercy or grace. Uh, God's undeserved kindness on those who deserve his judgment. Uh, The very first instance is there in in Genesis 3, isn't it? At least in a tangible way because as God sends them out, what are they wearing? Well, the best a fig leaf can offer, aren't they? And God says, no, no, that's not suitable. Let me clothe you. Let me give you clothing as I move you into the way. If you move into Genesis 4 and you see that brotherly rivalry that goes on between Cain and Abel, and as Abel is killed or murdered and Cain is judged by God and he pleads out because he knows that as he's cast out, he'll face a world where he will be persecuted. And What does God do for Cain? He puts a mark on him, doesn't he, to protect him. And that's a mercy of God. Cain didn't deserve that, did he? But God gave it. And you can go right through what's going on in Genesis 3 through to 6. And we'll get to Genesis 6 and things are grim, aren't they? Every inclination of the heart of humans is rebellious and God commits to washing clean his creation in a flood and as he does that, he commits himself to one man, Noah, and his family and he shows his commitment in a very particular way, doesn't he? He shows his commitment by making a covenant and so, Riley, next slide, God makes a covenant with Noah and his family and the rest of the world in Genesis 9. A covenant's a very simple thing. It's an agreement between two or more people. That's what a covenant is. It's an agreement between two or more people and the covenant that God makes with Noah is the first such covenant in the Bible. Uh, When you go back and look at it, you'll notice that it's between God and humans, but it affects the whole world. You'll notice that it's everlasting. You'll notice that it expresses a promise. What will God never do again? Wipe the world out with a flood. Uh, it's accompanied by a sign, isn't it? What's the sign? A, a rainbow. We, we went out to Wee War for dinner on Thursday night and when we looked back over Narrabri, there was this massive rainbow. It was kind of like one of the most perfect biblical images of looking back to see the promise of God and his commitment. God commits himself to what he's made through a covenant. And when you look at Genesis 9, you'll see that all the language there is the language of new beginning, the original creation, 
being restored. But what, how, how well does Noah go? Just remind me. He doesn't go real well, does he? Within a matter of verses, he's disgraced himself in active rebellion against God. And then that cycle continues. So that by Genesis 11, what are humans deciding to do? Hey, we're just going to build a stairway to heaven because we can do a better job than God. That's really the Tower of Babel, isn't it? And God judges them. It's such a subtle judgment. He just mucks up their language so they can't even say hello to each other. And then you have these genealogies that just go on and you're kind of scratching your head going, I can see the pattern here. There's sin and there's judgment and then there's death and death and death and death and death. And you kind of go, where's the mercy? Because we're expecting it, aren't we? And then you get to verse 1. You get to verse 1. Just the next slide, please, Riley. The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here is the mercy of God. Here's a promise from God. And the promise that comes from God is the foundation of for the covenants in Genesis 15 and 17. And Lynn read that one from Genesis 15. This is the second big covenant. And there are a number in the Bible, we've got to remember that word covenant, and they build on each other. They're everlasting. They don't replace or wipe out the one before, but they build on each other. They build on each other. It's kind of like climbing Mount Everest. Now, let me say I've never climbed Mount Everest. Talk to Daniel Hayes at Wewell. He lived in Nepal for many years. He's been to all the base camps. It's remarkable. But as you climb Mount Everest, you work your way up through a series of base camps. The base camp takes you further along the promise of the climb. Each base camp builds on the one before without getting rid of it. And as you move along, you adjust. You get used to the altitude. Your body adjusts. And by the time you reach the final base camp, you look up and there is Mount Everest in all its bigness. The fulfillment of that journey through the base camps. That's the way covenants work in the Bible. They build on each one till you get to the last one. And you go, there is God in all its bigness. In all his immensity with the promise there, the covenant. And God's promise to Abram is very clear. If you've got the sheet there, kids, you can fill this out. In verse 1, what does God promise Abram? He promises him a land, doesn't he? You'll go to this land and we find out what that land is. We find out down there in verse 5, it's the land of Canaan, perched there on the edge of the Mediterranean. And verse 2, what does God promise him? Well, Wyatt picked it up, a really big family. He doesn't have any kids at the moment, but there will be a massive family, too numerous to number. Verse 3, through this family, God will bring his approval to the world. That's what blessing is, God's stamp of approval. Now, does all that language sound familiar? People, land, blessing? Sounds remarkably like the pattern, doesn't it, that God had established way back there in the garden? It sounds like the pattern of God's people in God's place under God's rule by his word being blessed. And it affects all of creation. Did you pick that up in verse 3? All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Made to one man... One family, but it will affect the whole world. This is God's commitment in a covenant that will last. Now, before we go any further, we've got to notice a couple of important things about this covenant, this promise. The first is there's nothing to recommend Abram to God, is there? Can you remember from Joshua 24, we looked at it earlier on this. What's Abram doing when God speaks to him? He's at church, isn't he? Doing all the right things? No, he's not. He's bowing down to something he carved out of his own hands. He doesn't want to have anything to do with God. And God says, hey, Abram, I've got a promise for you. Easy to get a great nation when you've got lots of kids, isn't it? Much harder when you're 75 and you've got no kids. Easy to have a land when you're settled. Well, no, it's not if you're a nomad. You see, there's nothing to recommend Abram to God. An idol-worshipping man whose family is barren who constantly moves around. Everything you're not looking for. 
So it actually points our attention to the one who made it possible, doesn't it? By God's decision and mercy. And did you notice, secondly, that there's nothing that Abram does that earns God's generous commitment or promise? In fact, when we get to Genesis 15, what's Abram busy doing? Complaining. Hey, God, it's been a couple of decades. What are you doing for me? It's kind of like he wants to play a game of poker with God and call his bluff. What about the child? What about the land? God, what are you doing? Again, it points our attention that God himself does it all. Hey, Abram, come out and look at the stuff I made and try and count those stuff. Abram took God at his word. He trusted him. It was displayed in obedience, but God did it and Abram trusted. Now that doesn't mean, thirdly, that God just wipes everything that Abram's done under the carpet. When we work through Abram, as we're going to do later on this year, you'll find he's not really a pin-up boy for godly behaviour. I mean, at verse 10, what does he immediately do in Genesis 12? As a drought, this land's not all it's cracked up to be. I'm going to Egypt. And when he gets there, what does he do with his wife? Passes her off as his sister. And later on, we find out that he's adulterous. He's really not a good role model. And every time he rebels against God, he cops it. God doesn't overlook his sin. He judges it. But that doesn't compromise God's commitment. And so when you've noticed all those, who's really at the centre of this picture? It's God, isn't it? Unlike the habit of human sin, which puts I in the middle, here we have God showing his commitment to his creation, which rejects him, by coming back into the middle for their benefit. That's always been God's pattern, isn't it? Did you notice that from Genesis 3? And I thought Neil brought this out really well. When Adam and Eve had rebelled against God and had organised those really comfortable garments and then hid, what did God do? Did he spit the dummy and walk off? No, he actually came into the garden to find them, did he? That's the way God works throughout the Bible. God initiates. That's God's grace. His plan to bring plan A into being. And so when you come to a sum, the summary slide for week four, so Riley, move forward, please. Uh, you'll see that you've got some ideas there, kids. You've got it on the back. You've got a sheet there with weeks four, five, and six. And you'll see there that in the kingdom, God's people are God's places and God promises. Well, in the what? In the promised kingdom that God brings about. Next slide, Riley. God's people are Abraham's family. God's place is Canaan, like we just saw in verse 5 of chapter 12. And God promises to bless Israel and the nations. So we've had the pattern, we've had the perished, and now we've got the promised kingdom of God. Let me just draw out very quickly three implications and three applications. And you'll see them there under points 5 and 6. The first is connected with our understanding of the character of God. How we understand the nature of God affects how we understand his relationship with the world. This revelation, the one we've been looking at in the Bibles in front of us, reveals that God is in control of how much? All things. He works all things according to his eternal will and he's eternally committed to what he's made. That's the only God who can bring comfort or assurance or security. A God who's got to constantly be reacting to what we do as we career off into oblivion. A God who must constantly be looking for plan B, C, D right the way through to Z because we've really mucked up the first plan. A God who has areas outside of his will and purpose. A God who can only act for me because I choose him. Is that a God in control? No, it's not, is it? That's a God who's dependent on me to make the first move before he can do anything. That's a God dependent on me, isn't it? Not me being dependent on God. Which brings us to the pattern of his restoration. And I alluded to this and Neil touched on it out of Genesis 3. The pattern of God's salvation, his restoration, involves him taking the initiative. He doesn't ignore sin, does he? He does exactly as he says. 
deals with sin as it rightly should be dealt with. And every time he does, what is lurking nearby? God's grace, hand in hand, all the time. Now, if you think closely on that, that sounds remarkably like a certain event we celebrate every year, doesn't it? Where you have the judgment of God being expressed hand in hand with the mercy of God at the cross, which brings us to the nature of the Bible. The Bible works on a line of promise to fulfilment. God has promised to restore his kingdom. That's always been his plan, eh? And the rest of the Bible is the account of that. John Stott says the Bible is the sermon of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Bible is the sermon of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And at the heart of that ark is what? God dealing with a world broken by human sin, rolling it back to his commitment, covenant to the family of Abraham. That's the story of the Bible. And it puts who back in the centre? It puts God, doesn't it, where he needs to be. So let me draw out three brief applications. How you read shows who you believe in. How we read the Bible reveals the God we believe in. The Bible is not the account of a God constantly looking for a new plan. The Bible is not the account of a God who is constantly thrown off guard by the new and devious sin that Bernard Gabbard has created. The Bible is not the account of a God who is in an equal to equal battle with every human will. The Bible is not the account of a God who wakes up every morning to open the celestial newspaper and go, what have humans done today that I've got to deal with? The Bible is the account of the God committed to plan A. My people in my place, under my blessing, my rule, my will. That's the God who uses various types of literature, who speaks into various types of culture, who actually comes into the flesh at a particular moment. That is the account of a God who deals with sin at the same time as giving us what we do not deserve. Which leads to the second application. Who you believe in shows how you understand you are saved. We are saved from our sins by whose actions? by God's actions for us, not my actions to choose him. We are saved by God's actions for us, not by my actions towards him. We cannot deal with sin on our own. The best we can do is come up with a fig leaf outfit. That's the best we can do. But if God is the one who has been sinned against, then only God can deal with sin, can't he? And that's what we see in his revelation. Which brings me to the final point, the final application. Let me encourage you to view the whole Bible as your Bible. We are a people of two testaments, the old and the new. And if we forget the old, we forget that covenantal framework where God commits, makes promises that are eternal for people who want nothing to do with him. Wouldn't that be terrible to miss that? Terrible to miss God's commitment in a promise, a covenant with a man called Abram to give him a land and to bring through that family the approval that our world, the blessing that our world so desperately needs under the curse of sin. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we've got all of it. Thank you that you speak. Thank you that as you do speak, you reveal your plan A, your commitment to plan A. And thank you that in this, you do with our sin. Father, thank you that you do this for a world that is so broken. Help us to delight in such a God. Amen. Any questions? Now, some of these questions, if there are any questions, might need to be dealt with over morning too. But are there any questions? Phil, up the back. Oh, mate. So did you get that question? I, 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 no, I don't think Phil asked a question. No. So Phil's question is, why would God let Adam and Eve rebel in the first place? Good question, isn't it? In fact, I think a member of my family asked me that recently. Didn't you, Seth? 
um, and we talked about it over the dinner table. I, I think there are two parts to that. So, so firstly, let me say this. There's no passage in the Bible that says God led human sin for X reason. Okay, so there's no go-to passage. So we've got to piece together the revelation. I think on one hand, the revelation touches on a passage like 1 John 4, 9 through 10, which actually says this is love. What, what's love? God first loved us and sent his son to die for us. Now, if we don't have Jesus coming for us, that the obvious question is, do we know the love of God? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and this is a provocative limb, and you can bar me up later on. The word love doesn't appear in Genesis 1 through 3, does it? I think mean, that's interesting. Now, I think part of the revelation of God and God's plan A is for us to know his love. And we will know his love through the sacrificial life, death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, for rebels. So I think that's part of the answer, Phil. Okay. I think the second part of the answer is, uh, touching on something like Ephesians 1, 10 and then Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians 3, 20, 22, where the whole purpose of God is to display to the universe his glory through Jesus. Now, if we don't have those events of Genesis 3 and then God committing to his plan A, we don't have the fullness of that display, I want to argue. And so for those two reasons, I think that's why we have the revelation of the history of the world as we do. Does that answer your question a bit? I'm getting a nod for people who are listening on audio. Yeah. 